Welcome to Holy Heartbeats. My name is Nathan, and I narrate Christ-centered testimonies from all over the world. These testimonies include rapture and end times visions, near-death experiences, encounters with angels and demons, God, Jesus, and even Satan himself. Please consider subscribing to my channel if you are fond of listening to these types of stories, and let me know what you think about these testimonies in the comment section below. Let's get started. Dear friends, it brings me great joy to share with you a segment from the testimony of Jonas Lukuntu Impala, who devoted nearly 25 years of his life serving Satan. From childhood, he was spiritually adopted by Lucifer, whom he affectionately referred to as Dad. He served this master faithfully until a divine encounter changed his life forever. By the grace of God, Jonas met Jesus Christ, or rather, was found by Jesus, who showed him mercy and freed him from the chains of hell, where Satan, his merciless master, had already forsaken him. Jonas's testimony serves two essential purposes. Firstly, it provides assurance to sorcerers and Satanists that Jesus Christ is ready to forgive and deliver all those who genuinely and sincerely choose to repent. Secondly, it bolsters the faith and trust of the children of God in their Lord, Savior, and Master, Jesus Christ. Jonas's testimony consists of 14 chapters. In this video, we will be sharing the first and second chapters. We will also narrate his testimony from his perspective. Let's get started. For a span of 25 years, I was deeply immersed in serving the devil. From the tender age of two months, I was unwillingly initiated into the world of mysticism. I began my journey in sorcery, gradually evolving until I was allowed to partake in meetings with all the wizards across Africa. We used to convene in the Kalahari Desert, where a high-ranking demon, Hindu Sankara, reported our proceedings to Lucifer. After sorcery, I joined the catch where I possessed the power of the Tarzan engine. Subsequently, I was initiated into Indian magic, known as Magic K, a combination of Egyptian and Old Indian magic. I was then introduced to Holy Magic, a form of Catholic magic by a Spanish priest. I was also initiated into White Magic and became a member of the Amorque, ancient and mystical order Rosicrucis, also known as the Rosicrucian Order. I was then summoned to India, where I met Satan's Prime Minister. After working there, I journeyed to the mystical world of Pandemonium, married a white woman named Helen, and continued serving the devil. I was later asked to deliver four barrels of human blood, which I obtained through numerous human sacrifices. Consequently, I was promoted to the position of Lucifer's secretary. I then visited the world of Tartarus, where I met Lucifer. Contrary to popular belief, Lucifer was strikingly beautiful. However, his beauty was merely a facade masking pure evil. I worked closely with him, attending meetings with Satanists from around the world. We met underwater, at the convergence of the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, in a place known as the Bermuda Triangle. Deep beneath the water lies a large white temple known as the White House of Lucifer. Interestingly, I encountered several self-proclaimed men of God, including pastors, who were in fact agents of Satan. I am not permitted to reveal their identities, but it's crucial to understand that not all who profess to be God's servants truly are. On December 20th, 2003, I was delivered from this life of darkness. I was technically dead, with people mourning and preparing for my burial. I was chained in the astral world by the devil, but Jesus, the holder of the keys of death and Hades, came to my rescue. He didn't need Satan's permission to liberate me. He descended and freed me even though I was already dead and in hell. Praise be to his name. Amen. Following my deliverance, I was consumed by sorrow particularly when I reflected on my past actions. The weight of my deeds filled me with remorse, but in my despair, the Lord, ever present in times of trouble, visited me through the Holy Spirit. I am not unique or extraordinary. There are others like me who were entangled in Satanism but did not have the fortune to escape it alive. Some lost their sanity. Yet what did I offer Jesus for my deliverance? It was purely His exceptional grace that saved me. Therefore, I am committed to serving God for the rest of my life, come what may. This is why I am unafraid to share my testimony, as I know it causes disruption in the realm of Satan and liberates God's people. The devil thrives on the ignorance of God's children, which is why the Bible states that God's people are destroyed due to lack of knowledge. Ignorance is the root of destruction. End of Year Sacrifices to Lucifer In the dark world of satanic worship, Numerous sacrifices are carried out towards the end of the year. 
As a former Satanist who participated in such rituals, I can confirm that wizards present offerings to Lucifer annually. These sacrifices often involve human lives. It's important to note that every family has a wizard among them who prepares these end-of-year sacrifices. When I was a Satanist, wizards would seek my assistance to commune with Lucifer. I was required to address Lucifer as Dad, leading me to harbor resentment towards my biological parents. I believed Lucifer to be my father and a demon named Marie Madeline, who resides at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, to be my mother. When a wizard approached me, we would journey to the world of Polyam. There, we would sit around a round table in my department. The wizard would provide me with a family member's name, and upon calling this name thrice, the person would appear on my table. I would then end their life with my hands. After this, the deceased's skin would be used for two purposes. The first portion was used to create the Black Book, also known as the Book of Condemnation. In this book, I noted down all the curses dictated by Lucifer, which would then manifest in the lives of the wizard's family members. Often, these individuals suffered without understanding that their predicament was a result of a family member's selfish actions. The second portion of the skin was used to create the Red Book, the Book of Execution. The wizard would provide the names of all his family members, which I would record in this book. To meet Satan, the wizard would have to select a name from the book. Upon crossing out this name, the person would die in the physical world. After the burial, I would dispatch demons to retrieve blood from the deceased, which would then be offered to Lucifer. Only after Lucifer consumed the blood could the wizard enter his presence, a place of curses and death. The lengths to which wizards go to gain access to Lucifer's curse-filled presence is astonishing. Unfortunately, Christians often show reluctance to make even the smallest sacrifices to enter God's presence, a place of life and blessings. It's crucial to understand that wizards take their actions very seriously. Sorcerers, in their dark rituals, provide the names of all their family members which are recorded in the Red Book, along with all the condemnations in the Black Book. You might wonder what wrong you've done to these sorcerers for your name to be included in the Red Book. However, do not despair. If you turn to Jesus, his blood will nullify all the curses pronounced against you and erase your name from the infamous Red Book. When you live in reverence of God, the devil quakes in your presence. Many people identify as Christians, yet their actions don't reflect Christian values. As a former sorcerer, I possessed mystic eyes, 24 in total, enabling me to see everything. I could distinguish true Christians, hypocritical Christians, and even non-believers. If you are a genuine Christian, rest assured that both the devil and sorcerers are aware of it. Similarly, if you are a hypocritical Christian, they know it too. True Christians were identifiable by certain signs. The Indian Magic Indian magic is a unique blend of Hindu magic and Egyptian magic, with Egyptian magic being highly esteemed worldwide. The pharaohs, who embodied the power of Lucifer, passed down this power through generations. However, there came a time when a pharaoh had no heir. Before his death, he engraved a powerful sentence summarizing Egyptian magic onto a white stone and cast it into the river Nile. Years later, in the Vatican, the Catholic magic department sought to establish the Catholic religion in Egypt. The Pope selected Gandhi, a high-ranking priest, to carry out this mission. On his journey to Egypt, Gandhi passed through India and discovered the ancient Hindu magic, which operated through the Trinitarian code of Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva the gods of creation, protection, and destruction, respectively. Armed with this knowledge, Gandhi arrived in Egypt. While performing incantations by the River Nile, the hidden stone surfaced. He retrieved it, decoded the engraved sentence, and unlocked the powers of Egyptian magic. Combining what he learned in India with what he discovered in Egypt, he created what is known as the Upper Indian Magic, or the Magic K. My involvement in wrestling led me into the realm of Indian magic. I possessed the power of the Tarzan engine, bestowed upon me by a Kolwezi mentor. During my time in Likasi, I worked with a demon named Zagam, granting me control over nine cemeteries. I established a connection from the mountain where the Marian Domain of the Catholics was located in Toyota. A wrestler from Kinshasa came to Likasi for the fights, which took place from Thursday to Sunday, with the Big Game scheduled for Sunday. This wrestler, accompanied by others, was the standout competitor. He approached me telepathically and offered to share his winnings if I helped him win the fight. He pledged $400, providing an initial payment of $100.
I proposed a plan to ensure victory, involving the elimination of an individual whose spirit would aid us. By harnessing this spirit, it would be difficult for his opponent to access the mystical realm. The wrestler agreed and provided me with the name of his father. Now the question was, what was I going to do with this information? Beloved, I share this testimony with a heavy heart, as it is only by God's guidance and the deliverance of Jesus that I am able to do so. Though it pains me to recount these events, I feel compelled to express my gratitude. On a Saturday, I found myself in a cemetery, carrying out a ritual that involved placing my Kabbalistic mirror next to a cross on a tomb. I lit twelve red candles and burned two stalks of tchulai, a burnable deodorant with a strong smell commonly used by Muslims. I then sprinkled the perfume, Aus Arabia, over the tomb. As I concentrated and chanted incantations, the twelve candles miraculously lit themselves. The father in question was a member of the Bethel Church in Kinshasa. My intention was to summon the spirit of this father, and as soon as he appeared in my mirror, stab him with a knife to end his life. However, my attempts to call upon wicked spirits, such as Asmode, Asdamo, and Doros, proved unsuccessful. Even Kituta Murita, a powerful demon, did not respond to my summons. Frustrated, I called upon the Duke and the Marquis of Hell, but something unexpected occurred. As I prepared for the ritual, a flame of fire landed on my mirror, causing it to shatter. I was propelled backward and my candles extinguished. I fell into a deep sleep and only woke up the following morning around 6.30 a.m. It was already Sunday. I surveyed the broken mirror and returned home. On that same Sunday, the wrestler I had made the pact with went into battle and suffered a severe defeat. He fell ill the next day and was taken to Daco Hospital in Likasi. With each visit from the doctor, his diagnosis changed, and on the fourth day, the wrestler passed away. The one who sought to harm his Christian father met his own demise. Beloved in the Lord, I assure you that if you remain faithful to Jesus, your enemies will stumble into their own traps. Though my candles may have burned, the true consuming fire of God, whom the Christian father served, overpowered them. If you fear the Lord Jesus, the schemes of Lucifer against you will be rendered powerless. Those who conspire against you will fail, and their actions will rebound upon them in the name of Jesus. Let us take solace in the words of 2 Kings chapter 6 verses 16 to 19. So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike these people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Now Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. Pray to God to strike your enemies with blindness. Beloved, when we are in perfect communion with the Lord, our words will be approved by him. We must remember that we live in a world under the influence of the devil, who seeks to lead us astray and away from God's will. The devil is real, and his mission is to deceive and divert humanity from the path of righteousness. As someone who once served Lucifer, I had the ability to manifest as a ghost and undergo metamorphosis. I could transform into various creatures, such as a mosquito, frog, owl, sparrow, hawk, crocodile, snake, and even a woman to tempt the servants of God into adultery. Witnessing the power and organization of Lucifer, I couldn't deny his might. However, I have come to realize that while the devil may be powerful, Jesus is the Almighty. Jesus surpasses all things and causes the devil and his followers to tremble. I vividly recall an incident in the realm of Tartarus. During a meeting with Lucifer, a Satanist from Togo unintentionally uttered the name of Jesus. Instantly, everyone in the room, including Lucifer, fell to the ground. Lucifer himself was dethroned and found himself on the floor. Beloved, it is essential to understand that every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus is Lord, even Satan and his demons. If we maintain a strong relationship with Jesus, there is no need to fear the devil. May the grace of Jesus Christ be with all who acknowledge him as their master. As a representative of the devil, my role was to carry out the instructions directly from Lucifer. These representatives, known as proxies, serve as intermediaries for Lucifer. 
Unfortunately, among these representatives, there are also false servants of God who disguise themselves as sheep, but are truly ravenous wolves. It is through their actions that we can discern their true nature. Let us seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit to expose those who are agents of Satan masquerading as servants of God. I take full responsibility for everything I am sharing, and I am not afraid because I know that the testimony I give is not for my own glory, but for the glory of the one who has delivered me, and that is Jesus. He himself will protect me. My Bible reminds me that if God is on my side, no one can stand against me. Though they may fight against me, they will never prevail, for the Lord is always with me to deliver me. Amen. In my role as a servant of Satan, I even infiltrated churches. The church represents the visible part of the army of Jesus Christ, so it was our mission to undermine and weaken the church. Satan assigned us specific tasks within the church. The first task was to keep Christians ignorant of the word of God. Lucifer instructed us, if Christians are ignorant of the word, their faith will be weak. As it is written in Romans chapter 10 verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Lucifer knew that if the children of God remain rooted in the word, they would easily avoid his traps. The Bible itself teaches us in Psalm chapter 119 verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Additionally, Lucifer commanded us to discourage Christians from reading the Bible and instead encourage them to read newspapers, novels, and religious books. There are individuals who may not possess a Bible, yet their homes are filled with books like Awake and Watchtower. Do you know where these books come from? If you have books such as Watchtower or Awake from the Jehovah's Witnesses, I urge you to bring them to the church so that we can pray for you and dispose of them. This is a satanic influence. The sect of Jehovah's Witnesses is not a church of Jesus Christ. The first indicator of a church aligned with Satan is its denial of the divinity of Jesus. Even the devil himself acknowledges that Jesus is God. Whether the Jehovah's Witnesses accept it or not, Jesus is God and will forever remain God. Amen. The second task assigned to us was to create a sense of dullness during offerings and tithes, which is closely connected to the third and fourth commandments of Satan. The third commandment instructed us to tell Christians that God, their father, does not require tithes and offerings, but rather it is their pastors who steal from them. The fourth commandment aimed to keep Christians in poverty by discouraging them from giving tithes and offerings. Even the devil recognizes the secret of blessing, as Proverbs chapter 3 verses 9 to 10 states, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing. The third assignment involved blocking the church's projects by infiltrating witches among its leaders. Great caution must be exercised when selecting leaders, ensuring that the process aligns with the will of God. The fourth assignment focused on disorienting praise and worship and redirecting them towards Lucifer. To achieve this, we manipulated individuals who played musical instruments and served as choristers. It was dangerous when people sang without a prayerful life, seeking admiration rather than sanctification. Allow me to explain how we carried out our plans within churches. The devil seizes any opportunity to perpetrate evil. It is crucial that our God blinds our enemies when they attack us, preventing them from seeing our homes, projects, children, and all that belongs to us. During my involvement with Indian magic, there was a particular incident. Me and my master, who hailed from Kisangani, had to travel to Kalami to meet a siren named Marie Rose Ramaya, who resides at the depths of Lake Tanganyika. She is regarded as the goddess of rivers and seas. However, before our journey, my master invited me somewhere and handed me a package at 8 p.m. He instructed me, Tonight at 11.30 p.m. you will go to the cemetery and perform a ceremony. During the ceremony a creature will appear. Regardless of its nature, you must remain calm. You are not allowed to flee. If you flee, you will either die or go insane. Following his instructions, I returned home and proceeded to the cemetery of Sapins at 11 p.m. The package I received from my master was filled with intriguing items, including two white candles and a red candle. I placed them in such a way that the three candles formed an equilateral triangle. An equilateral triangle is a triangle with three equal sides, which symbolized the diabolic Hindu trinity. Along with that, there was a small bell similar to the one used by acolytes in the Catholic Church during the transubstantiation ceremony. This is the moment when bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Christ. 
However, this small bell had a darker meaning. It was satanic and was used to open the door to demons. In addition to these objects, there was also a white stone placed on the right side of the sacristy. It was said that demons entered the Catholic Church through this stone during Mass. These discoveries led me to question the true nature of Catholicism. Catholicism is not a religion of Jesus. It's just Satanism hiding behind a Christian facade. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to explore further. I was initiated into this mysterious world by a Spanish priest. Following his instructions, I arranged the items and uttered incantations. As I lit the three candles, I recited the incantations, making sure to follow every word precisely. I then took the small bell and rang it three times, expecting something extraordinary to happen. To my surprise, nothing happened. I started to doubt myself, thinking that I must have made a mistake while reciting the incantations. You see, when dealing with the devil, even the slightest error in pronunciation or spelling can invalidate the entire incantation. However, I realize that it's different when it comes to God. Even if we mispronounce a word or make a mistake, God still hears our prayers because he understands our intentions. Undeterred, I resumed the incantations, this time making sure to recite them correctly. After completing the ritual, I rang the bell once again. Suddenly, a violent wind started blowing in the cemetery where I was. It felt like a hurricane, and I was alone, just a young student in secondary school at the time. Then, a man appeared before me. He was dressed in a black toga, but what struck me the most was that his feet didn't touch the ground. He introduced himself as Hindu Sankara and presented me with a small chain of 108 balls called Mangal Sutra. This chain is comparable to the Rosary in India, in Hinduism, the Rosary among Catholics, and the Tasbih among Muslims. According to him, all of these practices were considered satanic. Before disappearing, Hindu Sankara reminded me not to forget my first sacrifice. The sacrifice involved eating a raw rooster at midnight, but not just any rooster. It had to be purchased from a specific family, not from a market. Determined to carry out this task, I searched the neighborhood, hoping to find the right rooster. It was getting late, around 3 p.m., and I was starting to lose hope. That's when I stumbled upon Kolomoni. As I was passing by, I noticed two boys leaving their house with roosters, heading towards the market. Seeing this as an opportunity, I approached them and went with them to their house. I inquired about the price of the rooster, and without any hesitation, I paid for it. While I was still there, I used a trick to make a feather fall by silently uttering incantations to myself. At 9 a.m., I went to visit my master. Upon arriving at his location, I shared with him the details of my actions. He commended my bravery and then requested that I return to the place where I had purchased the rooster to assess the outcome. Following his instruction, I made my way back to the location. As I approached the entrance of the avenue, I noticed a gathering of people in the distance. Curious, I approached someone passing by and inquired about the reason for the crowd's presence. It was revealed to me that a tragic incident had occurred at that very spot. Intrigued, I joined the mournful gathering where I heard the parents of the victim lamenting, our child was perfectly healthy, but at 11.30 p.m., he suddenly developed a high fever that lasted only a brief period. Shockingly, within 30 minutes, precisely at midnight, our beloved child passed away. At 11.30 p.m., I cut the head of the rooster, and it was around that time that the child also caught fever, and at midnight sharp, whenever I ate the rooster, the child also passed away. I would also like to share a confusing experience I had. At the time, I was still practicing Satanism and was dating a girl who belonged to a prayer group called Bethel Ministry. One day, she invited me to attend a prayer session with her. We arrived at the location, entered the house, and she introduced me to the leaders as her fiancé. They welcomed me warmly, found me a seat, and soon, others joined us as the prayer began. I found myself in a dilemma as I pretended to pray, unsure of how to properly do so since my knowledge was limited to invoking demons. I was there among the children of God. It is important to note that not everyone who attends church is genuinely seeking Jesus. Some may have ulterior motives to harm others. In this case, I was pretending to pray. After the prayer concluded, I accompanied the sister back to her home. Two weeks later, she came to my place in tears. I opened the door for her, greeted her, but she remained silent and continued crying. I looked at her, and eventually she began to speak. Through her sobs, she asked, why didn't you ever tell me about your true nature? Confused, I responded. My true nature? What do you mean? She explained. 
your spiritual nature. I replied, my spiritual nature? I am a Catholic Christian, and if you'd like to know more, I am also involved in scouting. She insisted, no, that is not your true nature. Your true nature is that of a great Satanist. Surprised, I asked, who told you that? She replied, while the leaders of our prayer group were praying, I had shared my intention to marry you, introducing you as my fiancé. During their prayer, they received a revelation from God, confirming that you are a great Satanist. In disbelief, I said, a Satanist? Look at me. Is there anything about me that suggests Satanism? I stood in front of her, urging her to examine me closely. Do you see any signs of Satanism? She responded, no. Beloved, Satanism is not always evident on the surface. It is a spiritual matter that can only be revealed through divine intervention. The Bible teaches us that the human heart is deceitful, and no one can fully understand it. Only God can examine the hearts and minds of individuals, revealing their true spiritual state. I reassured her not to worry, explaining that those who made such claims were driven by jealousy and sought to prevent our marriage. They were spiritual forces attempting to hinder her from entering into matrimony. I managed to convince her, and she agreed. I even provided her with financial assistance before driving her back home. When I returned home, I was filled with anger and made a vow to myself. I decided that the people who claimed to have received a revelation about me would witness my true power that night. With determination, I entered my secret room and focused my energy. In a moment of transformation, I took the form of an owl and held in my hand a unique weapon, a knife made from a human bone. While it appeared as a regular knife to the naked eye, it held a deeper significance. The knife was crafted from the radius bone, one of two bones in the forearm. With this unconventional weapon in hand, I took flight and headed towards the location where those who had spoken of my spiritual state resided. My intention was to confront and punish them for their false claims. As I arrived at their house, perched on an avocado tree in my owl form, I prepared to make my move. However, what I witnessed left me bewildered and unable to comprehend. Instead of a house, there stood a vast river in front of me. The very place where the house should have been was now submerged in water, making it inaccessible except by swimming. As I lacked the ability to swim, I transformed back into an animal and returned home. The following morning, around 10 a.m., I revisited the scene to find that the house had reappeared, but the river was nowhere to be seen. It was a profound demonstration of the Lord's protection and intervention. When I had initially sought to confront those individuals, the Lord had obscured my vision, causing me to see a river instead of the house. He shielded me from harm and confusion. Remarkably, the people inside the house were completely unaware of my presence. It was only years later, after my deliverance and spiritual transformation, that I humbly approached them to apologize. To their surprise, they had no knowledge of the events that had transpired. Beloved, when you are firmly rooted in the Lord Jesus, you can rest assured that your sleep will be peaceful and your enemies will be confounded. The Lord will blind them to your presence and protect you. The key is to be fully immersed in the love and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will share with you my journey to the world of Pallium and my trip to India, where I had the opportunity to meet the Prime Minister of Lucifer. Before diving into my experiences, let's reflect on a passage from the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now speaking about the realm of Indian magic, I want to emphasize that the entire world is under the dominion of Lucifer. During my time as one of his agents, Lucifer revealed to us that only Christians can escape his control, representing just 25% of humanity. He made it clear that the remaining 75% belonged to him, referring to them as his own. Interestingly, Lucifer never mentioned the name of Jesus directly. Instead, he would refer to him as the King of Christians. This deliberate avoidance of Jesus' name made me question everything I had been told by Lucifer. Discovering the power in the name of Jesus caused me to doubt the supposed supremacy of Lucifer. Lucifer instructed us to work diligently within churches to lull Christians into a spiritual slumber. He devised a seven-point plan of action. 1. Fight against or deny the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. 2. 
strengthen the power of evil in any way possible. 3. Promote homosexuality both horizontally and vertically. 4. Distort the teachings of the Bible. 5. Influence the business world. 6. Disrupt offerings and the daily sacrifice. And 7. Introduce competition and fashion into the church. Lucifer believed that Christians derived their power from their unwavering faith in Jesus. Therefore, his goal was to weaken their faith, knowing that without faith it is impossible to please the Lord, as stated in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. He provided us with his own set of Ten Commandments. As children of God, when we maintain a strong relationship and communion with him, he equips us with spiritual weapons. With these weapons, we have the ability to confront the depths of Satan's realm, dismantle Lucifer's strongholds, and reclaim everything he has hidden. However, to engage in effective spiritual warfare, we must let go of all carnal weapons. Some people may attempt to combat witches through insults or social status, but witches will only be afraid when we discard carnal weapons and embrace the spiritual weapons provided by the Holy Spirit. In this world, there are individuals whose blood has been consumed, yet they continue to live until their allotted time expires, at which point, physical death follows. It is crucial to take this testimony seriously, as countless sacrifices occur in the realm of darkness each year. These sacrifices involve people whose blood has already been consumed, and they exist only for the remaining time they have left, with the circumstances of their deaths already planned. During my time serving the devil, my master instructed me to do whatever it took to get married. As a result, he sent me to Lakasi in the commune of Panda, near the Panda River. Upon arrival, I performed incantations, and a strong light emerged from the river, revealing a white woman. She approached me and questioned why I had awakened her. In response, I asked for her name, to which she revealed it was Helen. I then expressed my desire for her to be my wife. Initially, Helen adamantly refused, but I persisted in my pleas, promising to do everything in my power to make her happy. However, it is important to note that we should not beg demons or confront them in Jesus' name. Falling under their spell is detrimental. On that day, I found myself begging a demon to enter my life. Eventually, she relented and informed me that if I truly wanted her as my wife, I would have to visit their realm. She handed me a yellow token as a requirement, and we parted ways. The following day, I returned to my master, who cautioned me about the seductive nature of the women in that world. He warned that if I succeeded in sleeping with one of them, I would be trapped there forever. To prevent such a fate, he instructed me to undergo a nine-day dry fast, abstaining from both food and water. Throughout this period, I recited incantations, enduring the physical and spiritual challenges. It is astonishing what a Satanist is capable of doing to resist demons. Meanwhile, there are Christians who refuse to engage in fasting. However, there are stubborn demons that can only be expelled through prayer and fasting, as Jesus stated in Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Some Christians even hide to eat when the church declares a fast. Beloved, when your leaders call for fasting, it is crucial to obey them, as obedience is superior to sacrifice. Disobeying your leaders even in secret does not go unnoticed by God. If you defy your leaders, your prayers will be in vain. May the grace of Jesus Christ be with all who acknowledge him as their master. My dear brothers and sisters, we will be sharing the continuation of Jonas's testimony in our next video. What do you think about his testimony so far? Do you believe in Satan? What about Jesus Christ himself? Let me know in the comments section below. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. Stay safe and I'll see you in our next video.